So, uh, I mean, uh, I would like to start with, uh, let's say, sort of general question to all the speakers, because uh, I, I was listening really with, with great interest all the presentation. And at the same time, I was thinking that uh, uh, all the presentation were pretty much focused on the analysis of the immune response in the blood when we are really looking at a virus that in reality is infecting the primary airway and the lung. So, so my, my, my general question is, I would say whether first, this is particularly for Jennifer, Leo and Professor Liu, whether they have also analyzed something that let's say more tissue related, more on the nose in the primary airway, and whether in general they are thinking that actually really the, the looking at, let's say, the correlate of protection, we should move from the blood and going more really on, on the tissue. And, and in a way also, uh, I want to open the, the discussion also to, to Professor Petrovsky for the vaccine that he showed a lot of very nice data in the periphery. He actually showed that the virus was immediately in a way uh, cleared by the air in the airway in, in, after two, three days, and whether then you have actually data on the, for example, presence of IgA or something like that in the tissue. Uh, I don't know. Um, maybe I'll start with, uh, with, with Jennifer, whether you have done some, uh, have some data or some thought about, uh, let's say, more looking at more resident uh, T cells uh, in the airway and whether the follicular helper cell might actually be important to be also located in the tissues. Yeah, I think the mucosal question always sort of hangs over us um, with every blood-based study that we do. Um, and we're particularly interested in looking at breakthrough infections now. Um, and that's I think, really a pertinent issue to the breakthrough infections as we're, we're trying to track the recall of immunity, but we're, we're sampling the blood. Um, so we do, have some interest in, in the mucosal side of things. And we have some collaborators who are looking particularly at antibody responses in the saliva. And I think some groups have started to try to use nasal swabs to sort of get a sense of what T cells are actually migrating. Um, but it, it's a difficult question to address, but it's incredibly pertinent. Um, and I think we certainly can't discount the role for local immunity. And that remains a huge question. Um, you know, what advantage do you have if you can lodge resident either B or T cells um, in, in the lung, in the tissues? Um, what role is there for, for tonsils and, and lymph nodes in those areas to contribute to recall? Um, and those are questions that really we haven't been able to address too well. There are some macaque studies, I think they can give some insight there. There's better sampling that you can do in those animal models. Uh, but of course there are limitations there as well in terms of how quickly the virus is cleared relative to how long it takes a T cell response to come up. So there's, there's still pros and cons to those models. Thank you. Leo, do you, can you tell us something, whether you, you have found some NSP12 specific T cells in the... Yeah, we, so in the same way, we're not sure we've got the right samples from the COVID sortium to look for local IgA. So we, we have some saliva and some nasal swabs, but probably not soon enough after potential exposure to look. But we have been trying to do that with a bit of technical difficulty, trying really seeing mucosal IgA. For, for antigen specific T cells, we're, hopefully we can share some data soon. We've been trying to look for pre-existing T cells targeting the RTC, in particular in, uh, uh, in bowel samples, um, because that's where we would expect these resident TRMs to be positioned after um, yeah. human endemic coronavirus infection. Yeah. yeah. No, on this aspect, if I can add, I mean, th there have been some also data of the group of Marcus Bugert, which I think he's going to talk, which he found already in the lymph node, of, in the tonsil, actually, cross-reactive yeah. T cell, which I found interesting. Uh, Professor Liu, what, what about uh, you, okay. whether you have also started to analyze other, let's say, anatomical sites in addition to the blood, and whether... And okay, for example, also when if you're going to study now the bats immunity, where are you going to find uh -huh. <laughs> looking at that? Okay, thank you, Antonio. Actually, uh, I totally agree with your you know opinion about you know we we should do something about you know the T cell uh, infiltration in the uh, tissues. Actually, you know like the uh, uh, because previously we have done some work about the influenza viruses infections. Actually. We found that you know the, okay the T cells you know decreased in the blood you know very quickly in the uh, acute infection. But actually you know we can see the you know the 
uh, different cytokines, including the uh, different um, you know T cells, can you know infiltrate into the lungs. Actually, you know we collaborated with the, you know the professor uh, Cao Bing in China uh, to find out okay the T cells can infiltrate into this lung, but actually they have a very high level of apoptosis in the lung. And actually, you know, in our lab, we just use also use tetramers to you know the uh, you know stain the tissue specific T cells. Uh, you know, it is a really works in, in, inside the different tissues. And also, we have done some work for the you know Zika viruses because you know actually you know Zika viruses can infect the you know uh, nerve system and also testes. So actually, we use the mouse model to you know. Uh, isolate the you know the uh, T cells within the uh, uh, spinal cord and also brain and also testes and we actually we have a very high um, proportion of the you know you know the e protein specific T cells within the different you know the uh, immune preliminary uh, you know uh, organs inside and uh, we are preparing that paper actually thank you thank you thank you. Nikolai, the, the question now is really more for, for you. I mean, uh, because for example, I mean, I know that the messenger RNA vaccine can induce a little bit of IgA, but really not so high quantity. And, and, and those are, we say, the, the mainly the, the T cell response seems to be really, for example, the T follicular helper response that is induced by the vaccine seems to be really localized in the germinal center of the lymph nodes close to the site of the vaccination. You have some data of your vaccine and actually there is also a question really from the audience that is asking whether your adjuvants can be used in different uh, anatomical sites. Yeah, no, look, it, it's a very good question, which I think comes to the, you know, the correlates of protection question, which, because um, we know that if you look at individuals, the, although the neutralizing antibodies for a, a, a group or a population seem to correlate with vaccine effectiveness at the individual level that falls apart. And, you know, you have people with high antibody neutralizing antibodies who, who get infection. They have people with low antibodies who don't. Um, now, whether Leo, you know, it's his, the T cells um, that are the missing piece there, or, or is it the, the, the fact that you need the immune response at the right compartment, you know, and I think it's probably a mixture of the two. The interesting thing about our sugar adjuvant, and we, we did a study with, with a large French veterinary company a number of years ago with um, Bordetella canis, which is kennel cough. And, you know, the, the, the Bordetella colonizes the nose. So usually when they, they vaccinate the animals then challenge them, you know, they can prevent the invasion of the lung and the symptoms, but they, they don't prevent the colonization, which stays constant. Interestingly, when they used our adjuvant with their, their protein-based vaccine, um, and it's the only time they've ever seen this, they got complete loss of colonization. So it, it's very clear that the, for whatever reason, the sugar-based adjuvant is generating a powerful mucosal immune response. We don't really know what that immune response is, um, you know, we, we do see some increase in IgA and in fact, in the phase two human trial with COVID, uh, we did see significant increases in serum IgA um, in, in the people who'd received the vaccine. So, so it is having an effect on IgA as well as IgG. But, you know, we, we, we haven't really, again, like everyone else, it's, it, it is quite challenging to look at mucosal immune responses. So it's something that, that we need to do more of, but, but I don't have any really direct answers in the human subjects of what's, what's going on in their noses, but uh, something that would be good to study. Thank you, Nikolai. And if I can just add, uh, let's say there is this question from uh, <coughs> the audience, from Dr. Archana Munje, which is directly asking whether your adjuvants can be used actually in other, let's say, anatomical sites. So if basically, I would say your adjuvant can be used for a potential nasal vaccine. Yeah, look, it's a great question. We, we're just publishing a study at the moment where we've given the adjuvant um, into the lungs. So as an intratracheal intra uh, immunization with COVID, um, I mean, it's still in animal models. Uh, we haven't got it into humans yet, 
uh, but we see a tremendous response and we don't get any toxicity in the animals from actually putting it in the lung. It, it also works intranasally um, and intradermally. So, so it does seem to work um, across compartments. But as I say, for humans at the moment, we, we're still intramuscular. We haven't moved to the other mucosal uh, applications. Thank you. Let me see if there are some other questions from the audience. Uh, Jeremy, can you tell me, please, how much time I have? I have still some questions, but... You have plenty of time at the moment, so you've got at least another, at least another 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. So, so maybe I, I, at this point, if there are no other questions, I would like to, to discuss a little bit more about, let's say, uh, immunodominance and different antigen, because again, I mean, vaccine now based on only on spike, uh, but the reality could be that perhaps, or at least that's what I, I am thinking, we, we should also really expand the, the, the potential vaccine to other antigen, which might be non-structural proteins like uh, Leo has uh, show or different uh, antigen. So now uh, at this point, I'm really opening the, the discussion to, to, to the panel and, and say whether they have uh, let's say some, some ideas, some uh, uh, what they're thinking about, let's say expanding vaccine to, to, to other antigens uh, and which antigen, because again, for example, antigen that are produced more by the virus or really antigen that are as a dynamic or viral replication can be the first one to be produced. Uh, I don't know now where to start. Maybe again, Jennifer, <laughs> or if you don't, I... <laughs> I was, I was going to dodge the question to more of a CD8 T cell person, uh, but, you know, from a, from a CD4 perspective, I suppose we, we focus so much on spike for the, the neutralizing antibody targets. Um, I think I'm, I'm honor bound to point out that binding antibodies to other viral antigens yeah. can induce FC effector functions and, and there may be benefits um, to providing more help there. Um, but in terms of CD8 antigens, there's probably someone who can, yeah, can speak to it better than I can. Um, but I think it's, it's clear from some of the CD8 touch from work, at least, that spike may not be the most immunodominant protein for CD8 responses. Yeah, that, that's true. Actually, my, your, your uh, let's say, point uh, is correct. But I'm, I'm just wondering whether, do we know whether, for example, in SARS-CoV-2, T follicular helper cells specific, for example, for NP or membrane, can actually help uh, B cell response specific for spike? Because I'm asking this question because, for example, in hepatitis B, this has been demonstrated to be possible. So basically, nucleocapsid specific helper T cell can really help uh, anti S response. Uh, do we have similar idea in, uh, in SARS CoV 2 infection? I think it's an understudied area. I know of at least one study that did look at CTFH responses to non-spike antigens, and they saw, again, quite robust responses. So there did seem to be you know, TFH reactivity and, and recognition of those other proteins. I think the missing link is taking it that one step further and saying, you know, what is the added benefit of, of those responses? Um, and that probably is an area that we don't have so much data on yet. But in terms of feasibility, I think it certainly is possible um, to direct responses to those proteins. And there are certainly proteins where you're going to get greater conservation between the human coronaviruses and, and SARS-CoV-2 as well. Um, and there may be you know, more cross-reactive responses that you can um, elicit that way. Thank you. Professor Liu, maybe I'm asking you in a way because I know what is, uh, let's say, Leo no has a particular protein, but maybe you, you might have some, let's say, different idea about which other they say potential proteins of SARS-CoV-2 should be introduced in a vaccine. Okay, thank you. Actually, uh, you know, one way, uh, you know, start the study on the, you know, SARS uh, coronavirus, actually, you know, 12 years ago, actually we identified, the, you know, the uh, one, you know, uh, hotspot for the, you know, the uh, immunodominant epitopes in the membrane protein of SARS coronavirus. So actually, you know, at that time we, uh, you know, prepared the, the, you know, DNA vector, the, uh, you know, the express the epitopes and actually we, uh, you know, the inject the, like the DNA vaccine so-called to the uh, transgenic mice. So actually we can detect uh, really robust T cell responses from the, you know, the 
mouth. Uh, you know, actually, I think, you know, people can also detect some antibody responses. Uh, previously published some other groups, you know, they, they can detect some, you know, antibody against the membrane uh, proteins. So actually, I think maybe for the, you know, the uh, SARS-CoV-2, so actually we also can, you know, you know, actually uh, develop some, you know, the, uh, you know, actually the M protein or N protein uh, T cell uh, epitopes derived, you know, the vaccines. However, you know, actually, I think, uh, uh, although, you know, actually my, you know, uh, topic uh, of today is about, you know, the T cell based, uh, uh, you know, vaccines, but actually, I still think, you know, actually, uh, there was some, you know, um, challenges for the, you know, T cell epitope based, you know, um, you know, uh, vaccines. Actually, you know, first, actually, you know, uh, because, you know, it is different from the antibodies, you know, T cells have some, you know, the restrictions by the HRA, you know, uh, alias. So actually, you know, we have to find some, you know, the different, uh, you know, epitopes um, for a vaccine, you know, cover different, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, HRA1 or HRA2 uh, alias. Especially, you know, when we consider that, you know, the, uh, there are so, you know, the animal model for the uh, HRA transgenic uh, is not too much, too many, right? You know, actually mm -hmm. we need to develop a lot of, you know, different HRA right. uh, transgenic mice. That is the one challenge. The other challenge is that, you know, we have to determine the, you know, the immunodominant epitopes. I used to say that, you know, we need, you know, uh, some immunodominant epitopes to cover more populations or induce higher, you know, responses, you know, how we select the, you know, epitopes, you know, actually when we determine the uh, T cell epitope spectrum, there are a lot of different epitopes, of, uh, you know, distributed within, you know, not only S, M and N protein, but also, you know, uh, open the frame might be or something, you know, a lot of different epitopes there. So how we select the epitopes, you know, I think that is not a challenge. And also, of course, as you say that, you know, the adjuvant, right? You know, T-cell epitopes need a uh, higher, you know, immunogenicities uh, when we use it. So actually we need to develop some, you know, good adjuvant for the, you know, the T-cell based epitopes, uh, T-cell based, you know, the uh, vaccines. Thank you. Yeah, no, certainly. I mean, I mean, I, I, even though I would say, I mean, if, uh, I'm clearly a fan of T-cells. I do think that, you know, I mean, vaccination and I would say it's, it's always better to work in coordination and, and yeah, there sure. is no question that I would say it is much better to have a vaccine that is eliciting both uh, antibody and T cell response. On the other hand, I, I, I think, you know, the, the, the problem of uh, finding the correct, uh, let's say, protein to, to add uh, is also a problem that somehow is related to what, what does it mean immunodominant? Because also it is not always true that let's say the most uh, abundant uh, immunity is always also related to, to the protection because uh, that is also something that uh, is not always uh, uh, fitting, particularly in animal model that was demonstrated. And on this, I, I do think that the non-structural proteins, since somehow some might be produce earlier, they might have much more protective effect. But here, maybe I, I want to leave a little bit uh, uh, the, the, the audience to, I mean, the audience to Leo, if he has to, to add something about uh, the general idea to introduce uh, uh, new antigen, new viral, new, yeah, new proteins to, to the vaccine. Maybe also that they can, all, uh, I would say, be protective from uh, many different SARS-CoV-2 variants. Leo? Yeah, <clears throat> I think the immunodominance thing is quite interesting. There's definitely evidence from vaccine studies. If you take away immunodominant epitopes, you can bring up subdominant epitopes. And sometimes they can offer better protection. So there's competition for survival factors for the T cells for presentation. And there's some data from George Cassiotis group. If you take away some of the dominant responses in S1 of spike, you have 
better neutralizing antibodies from S2 and better protection. For the non-structural proteins, something I didn't have time to talk about, which we were interested in, is the idea that you can have restraining factors, which mean you can have a different, you can have cells which express the non-structural proteins from the orf one ab um, but not the structural proteins. So for instance, there's one paper looking at rig I, which actually blocks the viral life cycle so that there's no production of the structural proteins, but you do get the non-structural proteins. And potentially you could have presentation of these and recognition of infected cells, which never produce structural proteins and, and the infected virus. So that's a bit more speculative, but is it maybe there's something about the viral life cycle which we can learn to try and select uh, antigens, which maybe better for early control, maybe infection blocking. Outside of the RTC, maybe other um, proteins within ORF1B are also highly conserved as well. So they might be good targets if you want to broaden the protection to future variants, maybe even other coronavirus. Nicolai, our, the question here is, uh, are you thinking to expand the uh, antigens in your vaccines? Yes, so uh, I, I guess um, there's a couple of points. One, one is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a big job to add additional antigens having, you know, developed a vaccine on one and, and the effort that goes into that. Um, so, so there is a, a reluctance on the manufacturing side to add that complexity unless you can prove definitively it's going to dramatically change the outcome. The, the other thing is if we are going to add additional antigens, the, the biggest question is, do we add more spike antigens, um, you know, to cover the different variants? So we've been working on a multivariant vaccine that actually has multiple um, spike proteins in it. And we're seeing some quite um, extraordinary benefits of, of doing that, of diversifying the, the spike protein. So, you know, to add non-structural proteins on, on top of that as well is, is it obviously just makes it um, a, a very expensive and, and complex uh, vaccine. But I, I guess the, the natural experiment is comparing the inactivated viral vaccines uh, against the recombinant protein-based vaccines. And when we did that with SARS many years ago, um, the biggest difference we saw is that with the inactivated virus, you needed tiny amounts to get the same protection that you needed, like a hundredfold higher, you know, recombinant spike protein in that case for SARS, as you needed with the amount of inactivated. Now, again, the question was, is that because you've got more epitopes and you've got um, additional proteins in there um, that you don't need as much of the spike? Or is it the spikes in confirmationally correct because it's actually in the intact virus, so it's presenting differently and it's in a VLP? But I think that's really, you know, probably the biggest test is what happens if we put inactivated head to head with recombinant? Can you show that the inactivated does a lot better? Because if it does, that might lead you down that path of looking for those additional antigens. But I don't know if anyone has, has really looked at that super closely to say, is the inactivated doing better than the, the recombinant protein or recombinant spike? Yeah. Can I ask quickly, do the inactivated vaccines, they're, they're not necessarily gonna have the intracellular proteins. So depending on how you isolate the viral components, they're not necessarily gonna have the non-structural proteins in that inactivated virus if it's a secreted virus that you're isolating. So then you would remove all of the proteins that are intracellular and a response to those. Yes, on the other hand, the inactivated virus do have membrane, do have MP, so the, the breadth of the, of the T cell and probably also antibody response is again increased. And which go back a little bit to, to, to the question to Jennifer, whether also let's say helper, for example, follicular helper cells specific for membrane and MP might actually boost uh, uh, the, the response to, to anti-spy, which is something that I, 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 I don't know. I don't know whether actually uh, Professor Liu can, can, can tell us something more about the, the response to inactivated vaccines since in China mainly the use is now on inactivated vaccine, am I correct? Uh, actually, yeah, we, uh, 
actually, we uh, majorly focus on the, you know, the recovered donors about, you know, the uh, recently we have, you know, uh, recruited a cohort from the, you know, the like uh, uh, two years recovered donors and actually uh, because, you know, uh, they have already recovered for two years. So actually, you know, from the uh, one year to, to two years, during this year, actually, they have been uh, vaccinated uh, for the, you know, inactive vaccine in China. So actually, you know, actually, this uh, population, you know, actually, they have, uh, you know, very high uh, you know, antibody responses and also the T cell responses. I think that uh, that is special, you know, a cohort for the study of the, you know, the uh, after infection, then, uh, you know, uh, actually, you know, vaccinated by the different uh, vaccines. Uh, but actually we are still uh, on the, you know, the way for the analysis. Uh, maybe we can, you know, actually communicate later. Right. Thank you. Uh -huh. Can, can I, there is a, a, a nice, I would say, practical question that is coming from the audience, from uh, uh, Dr. Rumin Gao, which is basically asking everybody how long, let's say, whether the COVID-19 COVID vaccine will become a season, seasonal vaccine and what we are thinking about further boost. Uh, <laughs> And now I leave it to you. Maybe first, uh, Professor Liu, what do you think about uh, whether we will have uh, to endure a, a vaccination every year or even more frequently, or the level of, let's say, maybe memory T-cell response will be sufficient to last for longer? What is your general idea? And then, let's say, I'm passing to, to the other panel members. Professor Liu? Uh, so actually, that is a very big question. Uh, so actually, maybe mm -hmm. we have, can have some reference for the, you know, the influenza. Uh, because like, you know, why we just, you know, have one injection of the influenza every year? Uh, because in every year, you know, influenza, although it have four different, uh, you know, regions, you know, H1, A3, uh, Victoria and uh, Yamagata. So but actually, you know, uh, but actually we only need one injection every year for the protection, you know, that is the, uh, the, the, the efficacy is uh, quite, you know, well. But actually back to the uh, uh, COVID-19, so actually, you know, why we need, you know, like recently three, you know, injections, right, within the two years. That is because, you know, previously we did not have any, you know, background, uh, you know, T cell responses or antibody responses against the coronaviruses. So I think, you know, but, but for influenza viruses, you know, actually we, from very, you know, from young child, you know, they, they infect uh, by the influenza, you know, almost everybody, right? Infected by the influenza. So actually, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, after the pandemic of the COVID-19, you know, actually, you know, the, uh, the natural infection together with the, uh, you know, the boost of the, um, you know, the, prototype vaccine. I think in, maybe in the future, it depends on the pandemic, right? If it, there's no new VOC, maybe we don't need to any, you know, boost. But actually, if there's still some Omicron or Delta Crown, something like that, I think maybe we need to boost every year. Who, who knows? <laughs> maybe. Uh, sorry, sorry, I'm muted. I, I... Yeah, it's really a difficult question to, to answer now. No, no, no question. But maybe Jennifer, you want to add something? What is your thought? I think you know it was clear sort of the benefit of the third dose in terms of broadening the antibody response and clearly at least you know recalling the T cell response to the same extent as the second dose. I think more data will come on the fourth doses, but the preliminary data that's come out so far isn't necessarily terribly convincing that we're going to see that same extent of, of benefit from a fourth dose, at least with the timing that we're currently rolling them out. Um, I think it's definitely fair to say it depends on the VOCs that come out in the future. You know, if we see something that's as escaped as Omicron is, but in a very different direction from the Wuhan like strain, then we may need to reevaluate what the vaccines can do or revisit the idea of how to update our vaccines. Um, but there may be a point where we're sort of reaching a ceiling of, of how high we can keep boosting people. 
Um, but you know, that being said, we we do target the flu vaccines to more vulnerable populations with the understanding that we're we're trying to prevent disease in the elderly and children. And so there may need to be more targeted approaches down the line. But I, th I think it does depend a lot on where the virus goes from here. Yeah. Now, on this aspect, if if I remember well, you you show that the third boost does not really increase anymore the T follicular helper cell frequency. Am I correct? Yeah, and I kind of joke about that data and say there seems to be one magnitude of T cells, you okay. know, similar in infection, similar after two doses, similar after three doses. Um, and so, if there's a question of how we can preferentially elicit that down the line, it might need a slightly different type of vaccine. Yeah, and, and do you have data actually in vulnerable people? I don't know, immunosuppressed or uh, or elderly. As far as concerned, we don't actually yet. That's something um, that we're hoping to look at down the line, but we don't have a lot of data yet on that. Leo, what do you think? <laughs> Maybe yeah. a, a pan, uh, a pan uh, coronavirus vaccine that might actually protect also from other variants by targeting a different antigen. Yeah, so maybe for SARS-CoV-2, it's a different problem to influenza. It depends how recombination of things go, because it's it, we don't know how well the, the vaccine responses would have done against Delta going on. And really, Omicron is evading lots of the neutralizing antibody response. Is that change in antigenicity of offering up new sites? So an Omicron-specific vaccine would be good? Or is Omicron just have a spike which is less immunogenic? So there's no an Omicron specific vaccine wouldn't add any benefit or any durability. I mean, some of the preclinical data is, suggests that it's just less immunogenic. So actually, even if you had a yearly Omicron boost, it wouldn't be necessarily so good. Um, if I can add, I mean, I can see that there is a question that is popping up now because, and I know that there is a general concern, okay, in some parts of the, of the maybe not in the scientific community, but maybe in the, in the general population, the, the general idea that continuous boost can actually make a tolerance to the, or the virus, which I personally don't think is going to happen, but I don't know if somebody wants to comment on this. Maybe I, I do a lot of work in, in allergy. So, um, you know, where we, we desensitize people by giving them antigen you know repeatedly um you know which is is more of a switching of the immune response it's it's not so much switching off the immune response it's actually just changing the so i think the, it's a bit of a fallacy that you you sort of dampen or, or switch it off um, it, it just changes its behavior um, interestingly when we we, we adjuvanted in humans a, a, a b venom product and, and everyone said, but that's going to make things worse because the adjuvant is going to enhance the immune response. It actually dramatically improved the desensitization because uh, it drove just a faster and harder switch. Um, so, Which is not so, exactly tolerance. Exactly. You make, you make, it's, a, it's a change of the function of the T cells which I do exactly. think is very important to point out because I can see that, yes, in the, in the general population, there is this idea of also repetitive infection that can actually completely delete uh, the, the antigen specific T cells which or B cells which I think is it's a little bit more a fantasy than the reality. I mean that sounds more like a super antigen effect where, exactly. where you really do deplete a whole population of T cells um, but, uh, but I think yeah when you're just dealing with a normal uh, antigen then um, you know, it, 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 you, you, what you tend to see, because we again have done this in influenza where we've given, you know, vaccines year after year after year, you, you tend to see that um, the people who have low antibodies, you know, get a good boost and the people who have high antibodies don't get a boost. Um, you never see antibodies go down um, because you've boosted someone. So I think it's more once you get to a certain level it, you know, homeostasis kicks in and, and you can't drive it up higher. But we don't really see evidence that somehow giving, giving the antigens repeatedly, you know, um, does what you're saying, which is, is switches everything off. Um, it, it more just, if it's already there, it, it just doesn't increase, but, but we don't tend to see inhibition. 
think generally uh, probably something to say probably our time is expiring i'm afraid so it's great isn't it i, I i'm loving the conversation and, and the great news is we're going to be able to carry this on albeit with a different set of experts but um please don't go anywhere because yeah i think a lot of these questions are probably going to continue particularly uh, i mean the, the the discussion about booster and heterolog i never said heterologous vaccination is going to be very very cool to continue the discussion so first of all a big big thank you to all of you to antonio for hosting the panel discussion we've really really enjoyed it and to nikolai to jennifer to leo and to william thank you very much indeed we really really appreciate it thank you